Everyone, welcome. Oh, I know something I want to do right out of the starting gate, and that is simply this. Why don't we all give an incredibly appreciative round of applause for all of these people who put this on, because wasn't it an amazing day? I just remarked to uh, Kevin Coswin, I was like a wet puppy dog this afternoon following Robert Rogers around while he's talking about violets going, oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that with the leaf. Just fantastic. All of the programs, we've been watching them and uh, really beautiful experiences going on, learning happening and passion for an incredible amount of skills. And so thank you all for being part of this. Seated before you are four legends and David Halliday. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I've been waiting to do that for three days. <laughs> uh, this is, yes, the titans of bushcraft. I, I'm gathering uh, from, from Chris and David uh, over there about the, the real... The real motivation behind all of this, uh, on one level, of course, is to recognize certain individuals in a, in, a, in a very magnanimous way, such as Mr. Kochansky, but also to recognize that, and I didn't really think about this till I think Chris or somebody mentioned it to me today, that, you know, the skills of bushcraft, and that, this is, in many ways, they're fairly actually recent. You know, uh, um, some, a lot of these skills came about you know, maybe a maybe hundred years ago, and maybe 70, 80 years ago, 112 or 140 years ago. And these gentlemen are part of the initial team of people, or were students of the initial group of people, that brought it, them to the forefront, that brought, made them uh, uh, desirable, if you will, in their writings, in their teachings, uh, and their continued, you know, passion for them. And so, uh, you know, we're talking about a, 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 a group of skill sets that is relatively young in many ways, and these are the pioneers right in front of you, right here, not including me. Morris Kochansky is obviously a legend. He's a legend to me. Uh, I've just met him for the first time this morning. But, of course, I had his book. And if... It, I'm not sure if, uh, of my cronies who didn't have it. Uh, it came out in 1987. Okay, great. That is what Morris is so famously known for, his book. But that's not where it stops. Northern Bushcraft is an incredible book that, ins that inspired and put fire under all of us to love and, and to explore these skills. But I'm sure Morris would, ag would, Morris would agree with this. That is that, that okay, that's my book. And then there's 40 years of teaching, of educating, of having passion behind these skills, of, of furthering the research, education, and scholarship of wilderness skills. That's why Morris is a legend. The book is one facilitation, one thing he did, that, as amazing as it is, that's one thing he did. There are thousands of other things that he did, and his students would attest to that. David Westcott... I've been joking with Dave that I didn't know if he'd remember me from back in the day because I did have the chance of meeting him once upon a time. David started learning skills with none other than Larry Dean Olson. And he, that was in 1971. He went on to start Boulder Outdoor School of Survival, BOSS. BOSS, in my world, as a survival guy learning in Toronto, Ontario, and going to different places, BOSS was like legendary. It's like, well, you, you got to get down to BOSS. You almost really were known to have not truly cut your teeth if you didn't get through BOSS at some point. And which means I still have a job to do because I've never been. <laughs> um, here's, a, here's something Chris wanted me to get across to you. At one point, David did three... Remember I was talking this morning about the intensity of trying to shoot a whole bunch of shows for the sake of television? Well, David did three 30 days in a row with one day in between each one, followed by two more 14 days. He also... 
Yep. You're going to be able to applaud these guys in a second. Yep. He also restarted Rabbit Stick Primitive Skills Rendezvous. Also legendary amongst all of us learning how to do the fireball for the first time was you got to get down to Rabbit Stick. He also, there's a lot of also's with David Westcott, founding board member of the Society of Primitive Technology. Again, a go-to must-have publication that was in my library and still is to this day. I still have my old copies. Right now, his passion is classic camping, and as a result, he's published his third book just a few years ago, Camping in the Old Style. Before you, you see a man that is a lifer, point and simple. David Westcott is a lifer. He was there before, he's been there during, and he's there after. This is not something that he's going to lose interest in anytime soon. It's not getting old for David Westcott. David Halliday is one of the, uh, you know what, yes, I'm gonna, I can talk about David Halliday because I've had some time with David Halliday. The words are that he's one of the foremost educators in primitive living skills, lecturer, author, consultant. He's been a consultant on many TV shows. Only one of note, Survivor Man. It's the only one I'm mentioning. <laughs> and also Castaway, actually, uh, the famous movie. Um, I don't even know how I got in touch with, uh, I'm sure it was one of those things, you got to talk to this guy, you're going to go to Arizona, you need to talk to this guy. And we met up, and it's one of those instant brotherhood moments that you have with certain individuals in your life. And I know David has stories about me, don't tell him on stage tonight, in private you can tell him, but I can kind of share them in a, in a more uh, way of brevity, and that is this, that, that um, he has always remarked about the fact that, that um, when I came to learn from him, I took no notes, I made no recordings, and on my part, that's fine. It's because I adored what he was teaching me, and I don't, he didn't know that at the time. Many months later, when he finally got to see the final cut, what he remarked marked about, what he saw, and what he never took offense to because I meant it as an honoring situation, I quoted him verbatim, word for word, everything he taught me. And for me, it's because I can't take credit for this hand drill or this pin cushion, you know, cherry fruit that I'm eating. But this man could. I needed to quote him verbatim because he was the master and I was the student. My show was just a facilitation of what I could do. It was a party trick. But he was the master and he is a master. It's calm, cool, and collected. Sadly, I've seen him naked. <laughs> you can't unsee certain things in this life, ladies and gentlemen. And he taught me the itsy, bit, itsy bitsy spider move on the hand drill. And you know what? When he explained it to me that way, I, uh, oh, I get it now. It's a bit, I get it. We're doing itsy bitsy spider up and down the hand drill. I only got my hand drill because of him. That is David Halliday. All right, that's everybody important. So, oh. Once again, I will refer to the words and then I will share my story about André François Bourbeau. <laughs> my, Canadian, my Canadian partner and friend, uh, survival expert, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Quebec, uh, I, I can't say that in, in, without bur bur butchering it. He co-founded Survival Skills Outdoor Adventure Program at the university level. You can imagine the kind of things this, this gentleman has been up against in academia to put survival skills into university. I mean, the, um, no, the amount of snickering and pushback that he must have endured over the years, but he endured, endured he did, and his accomplishments are adored by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students over all these years. He's taught there for more than 30 years. And uh, here's my... Andre François Bobo. When I went to spend uh, a year living in the woods, this is long before Survivor Man, before I'd met this gentleman, um, I, but I was already probably 12, 15, 14 years a survival instructor, right? So I knew my fireball inside and out. And, but now I'm about to spend a year in the bush. And I had seen the film work that had been done on him and I knew there was one man I needed to contact. So with my wife at the time, we were to spend that year, we drove to Quebec to meet Andre. And if you've met him already, you already know what I first ran into. I had a broken hand and a bear hug within the first 60 seconds. 
And from then on again, the kinship and the brotherhood, he pointed out to us things that were obvious to him and completely missed by us, which means it was missed by all of the books we, we were reading, the films. The, all of that was, we'd missed certain things he knew and saved, in many ways, he saved a lot of pain and strife for us to live out in the bush because of what he knew. But more importantly, I found myself in his apartment or house, I can't remember at the time, sitting on his couch with my wife at the time, with Andre standing five feet in front of me, with a guitar in his hand, singing achy, breaky art at the top of his lungs. I'm, I'm learning music less. I know you play. Here, let's. And all I got was, don't break my art, my achy, breaky art, with a French-Canadian accent. Now, fast forward to many years later, I'm doing a charity concert, and I meet Billy Ray Cyrus, <laughs> who turns out to be a Survivor Man fan. Who comes over with a beer in his hand? Hey, we've been watching you. And all I can hear in my head is, don't break my art, my achy, breaky art. <laughs> so there, <laughs> there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are, this symposium is honoring Morris Kochansky. It is, we, are, we stand and sit and relax and, and hover on grass in awe of these four gentlemen and others amongst us, in absolute awe. That's not to be taken lightly. But we also uh, follow in the footsteps of some other absolute masters. Larry Dean Olson. Hang on, hold on, hold on, we're going to do this all together. Let's put them together because they were all very much a together community. Larry Dean Olson. Steve Watts, Jim Riggs, Richard Jameson, and Eric Callahan. Now we can applaud. <laughs> and once again, I refer to that time period of the 60s and the 70s. That was the beginning of it all. That was what got, brought it into the hands of these gentlemen and then into the hands on down the line to all of you here today. So this is called the Titans of Bushcraft, and here they sit, absolute titans and legends in this industry. Little bit of maintenance, little bit of housekeeping and rules. We hope to have enough time to get to a, a Q&A. These guys are freaking verbose, so I doubt it. <laughs> but we're gonna possibly get to a Q&A. If we do, please, no straight comments, just questions, and just questions that you think the rest of us would also be interested in. Private comments and private questions, they're still here. Save that for a private time. Um, and uh, up here on the, on the panel, there's also some rules, gentlemen. For you, there's some rules. Um, please, if you will, uh, keep your answers uh, concise. Uh, we only have so much time. So keep your answers concise and, and, and not, not too many uh, wild, meandering tangents. Dave, and uh, <laughs> um, and we are about to begin. Um, we'll carry on from here, um, gentlemen. I do have some questions. Uh, the questions come from the from the, the group of people who put this this symposium on, and by all rights, they should be the ones to ask these questions. Um, I'll think of stuff along the way potentially, but uh, please feel free to um, illuminate us uh, in your answers. Uh, the first question I want to actually start off with is uh, my countryman, Andre. Um, well, there are two Canadians uh, sitting up here on this stage right now. And uh, I will say, I'll give a little backdrop. You know, the, 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 as Canadians, you know, we, we pretty much know that we own the Courier de Bois. We own the canoe. Like, that's our thing. As Canadians, we own the boreal forest. We, we really are quite proud of that. If you're into survival skills and you're a Canadian, you're like, yeah, we got a lot going on our side. Not so much the hand drill. <laughs> Throw us in Arizona, it's a whole new story. But give us a pair of snowshoes and start talking about uh, the Cree up in Mistissini, uh, Quebec. Oh, we are there. We watched many, many films, including the films that in involved this gentleman. So, Andre, uh, the question, keeping this in mind, is what contributions to bushcraft and survival education do you think is uniquely Canadian? We'll be back after these short messages. <laughs> Time's up. You broke 
You're going to want a thoughtful answer. Trust me. This is due process. Le canoe. Le canoe. <laughs> Go ahead, elaborate. You may. Please do. Mm. Okay. There was more fur trade in Canada. That's one thing. And therefore, more canoeing. And I can't say anything more intelligent than that right now. <laughs> well, how is that uniquely Canadian? Minnesotans might say, oh, we had the canoe too, you know. Maine might say, we had the yeah. canoe too, you know. But the main fur trade routes go up north and go out west into Canada. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying they didn't, didn't go into what is now the... Uh, the northeastern uh, forest trail that the, the, you know, of course, but uh, at the same time, just a little bit more of it north. How, how is it unique to Canada? How are bushcraft skills? How, uh, how are they unique to Canada within, within the scope of the canoeing and the fur trade and the roots? Because you're quite right. I mean, yeah. Well, well I think it's a, a question of weather. You know, the weather is colder, wetter, tougher in Canada because it's further north. You know, I was discussing it with, with David and, and uh, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. I did my doctorate in Colorado. Hell, it's way easier than in Quebec. You know, I, I teach, when I teach my, out, my uh, summer course in Quebec in November, you know, it's snowy rain for 12 days in a row, night and day for 12 days. I mean, that is rough weather. And I think that those bushcraft skills to face that kind of weather are unique to Canada. Mm. Um, David Westcott, it's, it's sort of a similar question to you. Uh, so we'll just stick with the Canadian theme for this opening question. Uh, the contributions that um, are made in this Canadian sense, uh, What's your perspective on that, is the differentiation? I mean, we're not here to create a border, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we're well aware of the fact that we are blood brothers and sisters up and down, and there is no such thing as, as a border to us. But nonetheless, in the sense of Canadian pride, where do you see the, uh, that perspective in the larger picture of bushcraft itself? Well, I think if you look at it the same way that the interview I did on the Internet that they showed... Um, if you look at survival in the U.S., Larry, well, Larry Olson is probably the nexus point. I mean, more people would attach to him than anything else, so there's a common language and a common way of looking at things from that. So in Canada, I think that the nexus is Morris when it comes to bushcraft. And as a result, you all speak the same language and you all radiate kind of from the same energy source. In the U.S. in bushcraft, we don't have that, and so it's just kind of this psychotic thing going on down there. So, so, I, so I think that's probably the, the, the thing, is you've got one hub that you're looking at as a result. You've got this kind of unified view of how things should go. And Morris as well, your, your thoughts on the matter of, of Canadian bushcraft, not necessarily versus American, just simply the unique Canadian perspective on the, on, on the, the passion and the pursuit of these skills. Mm. I think the igloo or the snow house is probably not built much in the States like it is in Canada. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, the, the boreal forest, there's the whole of Canada. We probably have less trees and shrubs, which is about 3,500, than in a square mile of Brazilian forest. So we're kind of sparse and... Uh, uh, you, you're not overwhelmed by the resources. Um, so we're a country that's not influenced by excessive heat. So we have a certain type of vigor that, uh, you know, with the... I know that Canadian soldiers were far more adaptable to almost any climate than most other people because we were used to the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. And so, 
generally we experienced a lot of that, so we knew uh, how to uh, uh, cope. So we have very hot summers and, uh, and, and very cold winters. But uh, I need more time in order to really do a good job at this. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I specialize in the boreal forest. And uh, so I found that if I confined myself intensely to boreal forest conditions, uh, I was uh, less spread out, you might say. So probably one of the aspects of popularity of the, the, the way I handled the subject in bushcraft, because uh, the, the trees and shrubs generally are found so extensively, and there's only a dozen or, or so, so you don't have to like learn about gazillions of different type of things to, to master that. The birch tree, the spruce, uh, we call it the spruce moose forest. So you find a lot of moose perhaps mm -hmm. more than we find elsewhere. Well, I think uh, uh, the, um, uh, a comment that I have often heard in traveling the world is getting uh, a comment of romanticism on, say, a particular tribe and say, oh, they're just so much better at survival than we are. And I, and I quite cock, in a very cocky fashion would say, oh, really? Well, we're in Peru. Let me bring him up to northern Quebec in the middle of winter. Let me see how good he does up there. <laughs> and so it became, you know, which of course is just Canadian pride, but it's a matter of, you know, you, many people are, are really good at what they do where they are. I, I want to uh, continue with you for a second, Morris, um, and we're going we're gonna to go into a little bit of family reunion history here. Um, what we would love to hear uh, when you first connected with the Americans, with uh, Mr. Westcott, Mr. Halliday, and Larry Dean Olson, can you give us uh, your first impressions upon meeting these individuals? Well, Larry Dean Olson came out with the, with the book, The Outdoor Survival Skills, which is quite unique at the time. And he was uh, working with, uh, there's a program uh, that I called the Anasazi program, that he called the Anasazi program. And uh, I heard enough about it that I tried to contact him, but he never answered my letters. <laughs> I think I bought about, in, in life, I think I bought about 100 uh, copies of his book and then passed them on further because of the nature of the, the uh, basic, uh, clear, uh, fundamental, solid sound. I stole a lot from his book. Uh, the, uh, if you look hard enough, he didn't seem to notice there are a lot of things that you would find in, in his book that ended up in mine. You know, um, the uh, situation was that, as a matter of fact, uh, I'd have to stop and think, and how come I, why did I end up going to the rabbit stick? Hmm? You invited me? Okay. So I met Dave who came and visited with me with regard to, I think, winter skills. And I ended up going there. And I was really looking forward to, to uh, visiting with Larry Dean Olson. And he was like a, I thought, is it me? He's like a, pump, <laughs> a slippery pumpkin seed because I sidled up to him talking the next thing he was gone. And so I never could really uh, sit down and really get to uh, until the, the wood smoke affair where we sat for hours and talked, but up to then, uh, I could never ever pin him down long enough. And I had to depend on pinning down his children. When I discovered his children were these events, I would, I would uh, have them answer all of the questions. And uh, what you, the phenomenon with Larry Dean Olson's book, I bought every edition, so I have this many editions. Every edition had something different about his family. Like for example, the original illustrator was his sister, I think, or whatever. And the kids were flabbergasted how much I knew about the family and all I derived the forwards and, and the information I found in the books because it changed slowly and other things. And they were quite impressed. I seemed to know a great deal about, about their family. But that's all I needed to do was become familiar with what was said in, in that regard. And how about, uh, how about uh, the two Davids beside me here? Your first impressions? Well, uh, uh, David, uh, uh, 
Uh, I think uh, uh, my impression was that Boulder Outdoor Survival School was going to incorporate a winter aspect to what they did, and actually, eventually, they they would come to my place, and so uh, Dave Westcott ended up coming to visit at a time when I had an exceptionally unusual course of what was going on. It was like a, a month-long course, and what he saw there was unusual because that probably only happened, that type of course only happened once in my career, but Dave probably figured that's the way I operated all the time. So he got a wrong impression from the fact that, uh, that uh, yeah. but anyway, uh, the, the situation, uh, I was very pleased for him to come down and, and uh, uh, you know, see what we were doing. Uh, now, Hal, Hal, uh, the other Dave. Yeah, you can just call him Hal today. Uh, the other Dave, well, you, most of you Canadians don't realize he's a very close relative, Louis Riel which, uh, uh, you know, the historical aspect, so his ancestors go back a long way. And uh, I met him, and I, it struck me as, uh, uh, you know, he's very scholarly and very knowledgeable uh, in, in his element. And uh, I always uh, I had a pleasant experience in, in visiting with him. Uh, I, well, maybe I... I, I won't mention it, but I, I thought he was, sometimes his shirts were a little ragged and torn, so, <laughs> so, I, so I would, you know, shirts that I could honestly <laughs> feel, feel that they were passive, you know, I wasn't going to bring the worst shirts, so when the, when the rabbit stick was over, I'd give him what, the shirts of my back, and, uh, <laughs> and so he, uh, he might have appreciated that, you know, the, the shirts that we found the XRCMP shirts in particular were well made and so on, so, so I hope that maybe as an instructor he wouldn't get too bedraggled. And, uh, he you might failed have... at that one, I guess. <laughs> um, Mr. Halliday, yes. uh, I'll just go right to it. Uh, tell us the hand drills, would you, if you wouldn't mind in regaling the audience with the hand drill story and David Westcott. All right. Uh, boy, he, his wife and him tell a different version, so. Uh, yeah. I'll, go real, I'll try to go as fast as I can, yeah. I was a single parent uh, with a four-year-old boy. Uh, I was a, uh, teaching school in Tucson, and I needed to recover from being stuck in the city for nine months, and so I'd go live on my land on Deer Creek, and I would just go as Paiute as the white guy can possibly go. So I, was, I, I learned all my skills by looking through the glass and imagining things and wondering how did they do this since I was four. And so Larry's book just helped me get a little 30,000 year leap, but I still wanted to be a caveman, right? So, so I was living as caveman as possible with as little clothes as possible, eating as little food as possible from any kind of resupply situation. And my son was four and he didn't know how to complain yet and he thought that's how life was. So all summer long, I'd said that I wasn't going to be able to do any fire if I didn't make it myself with no other tools but what I could use, Stone Age. And so at one point, this big, big, loud uh, Chevy pickup comes in with a boulder outdoor survival on the door. And Dave's wife and he get out and they begin to tell us, uh, first of all, he tells me how uh, disappointed he is that all the big money's be being made by the most disingenuous liars in the industry at the time. And I say, well, I don't know who they are, but I'm against uh, I I ingenuous liars myself, you know? <laughs> so we're, bu we're buddies all, instant buddies, because he doesn't like phonies and I don't like phonies. And so we talk for a long time, and then he says, well, would you show us about the hand drill fire? The, well, the way he knew about it is Larry told him that there's a guy living on Deer Creek that knows how, because nobody knew how to do it back then, but like, four, I was the fourth person that Larry knew of in white culture that was capable of that at the time. So I was, I didn't know I was a big deal, but Westcott comes to find me and says, show me how to do it. So I fail, and then I fail, <laughs> and then I fail, and I fail, and it's summertime and it's getting dark. That makes it about 9.30 or 10. 
And so I've been failing for hours now after talking about ingenuous people who talk a lot and can't do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> and so I got huge blisters and never got a fire. And I laid down and I took that hand drill and that hearth and I just threw them. And they're not very heavy, so they only flew about 15 yards. They landed in a, in a, service, in a, in a, in a sumac bush lemonade berry bush and they didn't hit the ground but I didn't know that because it was too dark and I laid down and I went to sleep and normally I get up and pee about three or four times a night that night I didn't wake up and I woke up in the morning at 4 30 or 5 in the dawn light dawn with drooling into the sand looking across the fire and the first thing I saw was that hand drill and that hearth in that bush a long ways across the way and I said why didn't those work so I went and grabbed them and I got a spark first time down the spindle. And I thought, I'm going to keep this thing alive. And I grabbed my four-year-old, and I got him on my shoulders with my Apache match. And I marched to Boulder, Utah, the, the seven-something miles. Or it's probably only four and a half across the mesas if you cut you know, off. So I went cross-country, got to Dave's trailer. Doom, 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 doom. And I think it's late in the day. And he's just waking up. It's like seven in the morning now. And... Uh, in his boxer shorts and groggy eyes, he looks out the door at me and like, hi again. I just, you know, and I went, there's your fire, Mr. Westcott. <laughs> uh, follow that. Uh, David Westcott. If we want to use semantical terms, you know, we, we're kind of toying with the idea that we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a golden era, someone might call it the golden era uh, of bushcraft and survival um, uh, skills, primitive earth technology. And David, you were in the thick of it, in the middle of it, all the way through it. Can you reflect upon that fact for us? Can you share with us what w we know what it's like here and now and everything we've been discussing for, you know, 36 hours here. But what was it like to be part of, of all of that, if you can reflect upon that? Uh, I think probably the, the coolest thing is to watch the advancement in the, in the application of the skills. In other words, what was going on in the 70s, nobody was doing hand drills. I mean, it was very rare if anybody was doing a hand drill. Pottery was still pretty much unknown. Uh, how to do that kind of stuff. So it, everything was really rudimentary. Even though there was lots of good books on it, there was not that many great practitioners. And they just start, all of a sudden started bubbling to the top. And when we started Rabbit Stick, our whole goal at Rabbit Stick was, to, was for my staff at Boss to meet as many of the best instructors as we could in, in the shortest amount of time. And so we started Rabbit Stick and just sent out a letter and said, if we did this, would you come? And lo and behold, we had... Uh, probably about 50 people. The first one came, and then it's grown to over 600 each one we do now. But and and we have probably 90 instructors uh, teaching at those events. But the level of, of expertise is just mind-boggling now. What's what is available to a person today is what was available to a person in 1970, and uh, the level of teaching has grown so far so fast that a lot of people don't realize that they really are standing on the shoulders of, of people who put a lot of time and energy into, into rediscovering how those things work. And, um, and I think a lot of them are getting lost in the, in the mist as we, as we go forward. And I'd like to keep that from, from happening. Uh, the fact that there, these, these people were very important to what we're doing. And um, yeah, so that's the coolest thing, is, is to just have been a part of that legacy, of watching, it, watching it develop. What, I'm just going to riff off that a little bit. Um, what would be, what are the ways to keep that, that uh, legacy going in your mind? Well, first learn it. You know, I, I uh, at least my observation of what's going on in the States is that the appetite for content is so great with, with YouTube, everybody having, everybody having to post some, something every day or every week in order to monetize their sites are just posting and pushing, putting as much content on the airwaves as they can, as fast as they can, 
without ever learning the context of it or where it came from, who taught it, who developed that kind of stuff. So that's probably my biggest disappointment with what's happening right now. And my whole career has been focused on making sure that you give credit where credit is due, honor your mentors, and um, make sure that uh, you understand where this stuff comes from. And so a lot of it is, is gaining ground and being duplicated and replicated and used all over the place without, without ever having not only the interest, but the care, you know, caring where it comes from. Uh, and I think that's short, short circuiting the, the quality of a lot of what's available out there because it, it's, it's just scratching the surface. So it's lots of information that deep. And uh, I think I'd like to see that change, that people really take time to investigate stuff deeply. So I think that's an important point as far as, uh, as we would just superficially call it, putting the time in. Um, I, you know, I, I touched on you know the five senses becoming the sixth sense. It takes time. Kelly is uh, speaking to the fourth skill, which is essentially the same thing. It's really digging in, going from I was taught this to I've been experiencing this for some time now. So now, even though I was taught it four years ago, I actually only understand it this weekend. Uh -huh. You know, and and that I agree is something uh, very very important to these skills. Um, Andre. You, you, your talk this morning uh, was detailed, I believe, a bit on this next question. Um, so we're looking for a bit of a, a summary here. But um, so if we are to teach these skills in a way that we can present authenticity in them, and I'm thinking of the BOSS programs and all these different programs where in the end you kind of come home from the weekend going, Glad nothing went wrong that weekend. Um, that could have gone sideways. Um, now, <laughs> I won't even go to the point of all the litigations and liabilities and all that, but if we want to continue teaching these skills in an authentic way, how do we do that while handling the risk of them at the same time, the inherent risk that is involved with taking people on 30 days out into the, the desert to <laughs> bite rocks, so to speak, or stay in minus 45 degrees overnight. Yeah. Well, it's risk management. You know, I mean, I'm, I, th I think the outdoor world has gone full circle. Uh, at, in the 70s, in the 80s, even in the 90s, we would just get away with anything. There were no rules, no, no restrictions, no insurance problems, and nothing else. And then all of a sudden, there were a few accidents. And those few accidents got everybody out of the outdoor world and say no more, no more uh, classrooms, uh, outdoor classrooms. Kids don't go out in outdoor classrooms. There was a huge m movement from the University of Illinois back then that, uh, you know, outdoor education and, and bring kids. Uh, we had, we had uh, kids, uh, we had, uh, for example, we had uh, some of my students were made a business out of bringing a prospector's tents in, into the schoolyards and having kids rotate to different outdoor activities and you know this was called outdoor education and that all went down the drain because of there was no risk management and because there was no risk management all of a sudden poof it's gone and nobody lets you do it anymore the, the parents said I'm not letting my kid go do that he's going to die and now it's starting to come back because you're proving to everybody that risk management works and we're bringing everybody back up to the level that is necessary to get it done right. So we're not putting anybody uh, saying, we're gonna take, oh, we're taking a beginner, we're putting them in an R3 rapid. No, we're taking a beginner, we're putting in an R1 rapid and then we're doing risk management and we're proving to everybody that before he goes into an R2 rapid, he's going to be trained enough to go into R2 rapid. The teacher is going to be trained enough to go into R2 rapids. And before we go to the R3 rapids, then there's going to be this progression and risk management is doing that because it's proving to everybody what we've done. So the only way we're going to get this to go full circle and to come back is through risk management, unfortunately, so that we can, we can prove to everybody that it's not dangerous if we do it right or it's not more dangerous than anything else. And in risk management, we always say, you know, you go skiing, you break a leg, no normal. You go hiking, you break a leg, not normal. Why is it not normal? And it has to become normal. 
And in, in, in Australia, for example, they had a, a death of a kid in a, in a canoe program and uh, in a school. And their parents funded that same program to keep it going and get it going again because they had faith that it was a real accident because the risk management program was solid enough to, to handle it. Okay, so we're going full circle, and that's, I think, the answer. And I have a more intelligent answer to the question you asked me the first time. Oh, yeah. Riff, go my friend, go my friend. It's, it's black flies <laughs> and mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the difference is, and the difference for bushcrafter, you have to understand this. The difference is that if, if okay, Pierre Dansereau put it to me this way, he said, it's a hell of a lot easier to say, my brother the wolf, than to say, my cousin the mosquito, <laughs> okay? And if you want to, you know, a nice nature, nice fun nature and everything else, that is so easy in a place like Colorado, because I had a border bike there and rode it every day of the entire year, except for three or four days in, in, in January. Now, in Quebec, when I drove my motorbike back to Quebec, after a week I sold it because I had so many black flies in my face, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff. So, when you're in Quebec in the north, and the mosquitoes literally, just because your hands up are out of your shirt, you can't shake them off. I mean, they are so thick, so bad, that it's hard. And, it, it, and it's, it's the... Um, Nice day after the rain phenomena. It has to rain to, to feel the, the right day. So if you're a Canadian and you're way up there and you're into this bad stuff, you appreciate so much more the time, the, the day, that it's beautiful out and that it's nice out. And then, like, you've been through hell and back, through these black flies and cold and mud. And so, so, so it's like you appreciate it even more and you're even more in tune with that nature because you appreciate that it doesn't happen all the time. I've got the same Eastern Ontario, Quebec pride. Sorry, guys, but our Sorry. black flies. I, I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, when, I, when people ask about bugs and I've been able to, um, through the endeavors, Survivor Man experience the worst of bugs all around the world in the worst conditions, pound for pound, Ontario black flies. That's what I always say. No, I'll, I'll show you bugs. It always comes back to the black flies. Um, I want to go back to uh, though you, your first commentary, and Morris, I want to, I want to ask you, I, I, I'd love to get your reaction to that. What's your, your thoughts on the future of this? But keeping in mind the, um, the fear factor of, of the problems of, of litigation and liabilities and the fact that so many schools and people are afraid to, to teach a teenager how to hold a knife. Uh, sort of thing. What's your thoughts on this and moving forward and how we get back to, um, um, a, I guess, a better time of this? Well, there's a evolution going on in some respects, <clears throat> especially, well, I don't, I don't keep up with the issues, but I get the impression that the industrial arts programs that we have in the province are too expensive, too dangerous, too much everything else, and the hierarchy figures, you know, why are we teaching in, in school? They want to pick up the technical type stuff, uh, do it on your own as a citizen, and avoid doing that, and so now we're suffering from uh, not enough people to fill a lot of the roles, so we got to hire people from Europe or from Czechoslovakia or, or Italy or whatever to fill in what a Canadian should actually fill in because that phenomenon is sort of seems to be prevalent that uh, too much trouble, too dangerous, too costly. Therefore, let's just uh, drop to a simpler mode where we don't uh, encounter that. Now, if we're talking about outdoor red, we're... We're, my take on the subject is, uh, uh, well, they stopped asking me going to the outdoor ed conferences when I started to decide, write a great big E on the blackboard and then a little O that you mistake for 
uh, a period because the big E and the, and, and the O is so small that you might often say that uh, uh, we can't be creating uh, environmental uh, desecration by lighting campfires and building lean-tos and, and all that sort of stuff that kids respond to. And so there is no outdoor ed. Uh, but there's a few other things that come up. Uh, the sensitive environmentalists sort of uh, are saying, well, we want to learn more about Brazil, but they neglect to learn more about their own doorstep, you might say. <clears throat> And, and the big problem that I see in outdoor education, working with our kids from kindergarten to grade 12, was that the uh, uh, phys ed teachers who traditionally produced the uh, uh, lifeguards, swimming instructors, and uh, uh, canoeists and skiers were also struck with outdoor ed when that should have gone, the outdoor ed should have been distributed with the home ec teacher for clothing and groceries and the science teacher for plants and the mathematic teacher. And so as a result, expecting the phys ed teacher to do everything, I think had a profound negative effect because they really uh, weren't very specifically trained or distributed their responsibility throughout the rest of the school. And I think the outdoor education, I don't know, I haven't, in the last, Five years, I don't know what the state is because they stopped inviting me on account of my, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, cynical uh, situation that I saw no progress and that there was very little outdoor ed stuff. Outdoor ed, you cut, make bow beds, you, you, you build big fires to stay warm and so on. There, there are people that were in the position, oh, we don't want that. And then, of course, uh, um, I depend very heavily on making bow beds and, and uh, huge fires uh, in the sense that uh, uh, whenever there is the issue of examining yet another survival manual, usually the, clo the, 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 the fires and the shelters are just so... Uh, Made safe. Uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a continuum between kindergarten and grade 12, they rarely reach grade three. So how can you be sophisticated in a lot of that stuff? The teachers uh, wasn't around and emphatic enough. I said, when you teach a lean-to, you're supposed to discuss all of the things that an architect has to know uh, uh, to build a house. Therefore, that becomes part of the education. So when the kid birds a lean-to, they know about thermal mass and reflectivity and, and emissivity and, uh, you know, all those sort of things. Well, it's not incorporated into the curriculum because they don't recognize that's the way you should go and on and on. So I got, like I say, cynical and dropped out of the picture. And I had more time at home with my family. <laughs> at, uh, because there, there were people in the school system that if I was introduced as a survivalist, they wouldn't shake my hand. They were so, uh, uh, so poor in good manners that they just didn't want to shake my hand because I was uh, lit big fires and desecrated the forest because they hadn't taken... I said that almost every environmentalist I saw said, uh, if you had to take care of yourself with your attitude, you'd probably be dead within the week because of your <laughs> negative, negative notion. You missed the point. You're embroiled in environmentalism. And, and people would say, Morris, you, if you keep uh, making those bow beds and those lean-tos, you're going to eliminate the forest. And I say, well, I'm not exactly sure if everybody in Edmonton spit at the same time. Would you have a flood? <laughs> and, um, so, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm getting rusty on those uh, type of things where I was always the devil's advocate and saying, you know, when, when they eliminate fire, I say I teach fire because so many kids would go home and see what's happening and say, Dad, you know, in Outdoor Ed, we, we were taught that if you do that, the house is going to burn down. The issue isn't fire for a campfire and a wiener roast. The issue is fire plays such a big role in generating electricity and gazillion other sort of things 
And every citizen should be knowledgeable with regard to staying safe around fires and not bur burn forests down and all that. That was the issue. And they missed the point. They, uh, they, uh, well, anyway. I, no, I think that's perfect. Um, I, 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 if you guys are, are good, I'd like to stick with this for a minute. And um, I, I'd love these two gentlemen's comments, starting with Mr. Halliday. What, moving forward. Moving forward. Uh, I don't. I don't like. Uh, I don't like the fact that people that are the most ingenuous and incapable knife handlers become representatives of knife companies. Stuff like that. So, uh, without being nice at all, I'm going to say, if I pretended to be a doctor, wouldn't I go to jail? If I pretended to be a police officer, wouldn't I go to jail? That said, I hate the paint-by-numbers world where we're going to make everybody go through some standard in order to become something. Because I'd never become anything if I had to do that. You guys have decided I'm worth being on this panel by my actions, I guess. I hope I'm not just... Blowing hot air. I've done some things. Wait, you don't have your certificate? Of I don't. I don't have a thing. In fact, my college, my college career ended. My my scholastic pursuits ended the day I met Larry Dean Olson. So so moving forward then. Yeah. I mean so moving I, forward so, obviously. So, so that, saying that, I'd like to say that how do you create a system of creating credibility without squelching the free spirit of the event? Because otherwise, you've created another series of laws, and we're complaining about some of those laws right now. How do you do that to our world, our little survival world, or our outdoor living skills world, without pinching it into some little tiny corner where, where, where only uh, people that aren't uh, bothered by that can become uh, instructors? How do you get an instructor certificate? Because I, I got one from Dave Westcott. But he never told me I did. He just kept inviting me back. <laughs> but when I met this amazing educator over here, he, Morris Kahansky changed my life because I saw how much he was thrilled like us by the subject matter. But it was the most important thing was accuracy and truth in subject matter. That's what thrilled me. And I'd like to see some way for us to create that uh, pattern without squelching, uh, without making there be some kind of, you know, Nazi step, let's all get in line and be perfect according to who, you know. And so I'm kind of a rebel that way, but I, I'm really, you know, I'd almost like to leave it alone if it's going to go that way. And let phonies just drop out because everybody figures it out. Well, I don't think you're a rebel at all. I mean, um, th there's, that's a murmur of discussion that's been going on, and Chris and I were chatting about it. I'd like to see honest people uh, make a good living uh, because they're honest, and, not, and, and then have some way to, to regulate liars. Mm. I mean, it happens in the medical industry often. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Well, I'm, I mean, I might. You know, <coughs> yeah, you I, know I think, what I mean. No, but you I think in mean. responding to Dave, one uh, yeah. of the you know, one of the pushbacks I might say is, well, they tend to sometimes expose and regulate themselves, you know, without us having to to focus on them. Um, and I agree. When we were discussing earlier, I was thinking like, yeah, like, you know, what would Jeremiah Johnson say? <laughs> would he, has he got a certificate on his cabin? <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Westcott, uh, um, could you could you also? Your, your thoughts on, on how we move forward with, with the teaching of these skills and, and, and potentially even bring it back to, to the way things were or advance? Um, I, I think if it gets people outside, go do it. <laughs> you know, just get, the more people outside, the better. Uh, and I think that's a, a good thing. What about the outside? What's going to happen to it? Well, it'll... Take care we of already know that, the, as, as Morris told us, all the trees will be cut down if we build too many bow beds. So, yeah. So, but I think you know, to get people outside is number one. And uh, if they're if they're going, more power to them. Uh, if, if you're looking at it from a profession, and you're talking about being a, a teacher, then I think that's a little bit different. Yes. Um, but at the same time, I agree with David. You know, if you're doing something that ends up stifling creativity, then then you've ruined the whole thing. 
So there's got to be some way that, uh, and I don't, you know, I think it's been an argument for a long time across the pond how, how this should be going forward. Um, and I don't think they've even answered it after 20 plus years. So um, as, as recent as it is here, I don't know if we're ever going to get there either. It'd be nice to, to kind of get it by the, by the hand early and um, decide, well, I, I, I don't have the answer. I've well, actually, if I'll, I'll respond to you a bit, and, and, and I, I think Mr. Bobo might be able to answer. Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in front of you there, but uh, another, you know, another thought was, it was put to me this, this morning, is, well, in many ways, what can happen in situations like this is right now we're behind that. Now there's some kind of st strange and weird accident that happens to some school student somewhere. Now the government is saying, these skills need to be regulated. Now, or sorry, we were in front of it now. Now we're behind it. Now we're playing catch up. And then they're saying, well, who? Well, let's call Mr. Kochansky and Mr. Westcott and, and let's get, get 20 people in a, in a boardroom, but we're playing catch up because somebody died. So it does become, this is a very, sort of ugly, messy discussion that we aren't going to solve here tonight. Everyone understand that, but it is important that, that all you instructors out there hear what these gentlemen have to say. And I, I, Andre, I can, I can see you've got something there, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn this to you. Yeah, well, if, if somebody has been a rebel, guilty, no? Uh, for example, uh, bringing um, students Getting, getting a uh, 40 cords of firewood dumped on the university land right in front of the university and getting my students to go chop it up and sell it to people for financing and, and ways to learn how to do that. I almost got crucified for that kind of stuff. You know? And in academia, you can just imagine, I'm gonna take them caving in Mexico, okay? I'm going to take them on a bicycle ride from Colorado to California over the Rocky Mountains. And I did it. And, and I was a rebel. And lots of people, like so many people, put, put fences in front of me. And they didn't want me to go there. And they didn't want me to cut firewood because they looked, oh, he's cutting firewood in the middle. No. And, I'm supposed to be a university professor and I do this. And I'm dressing with my clothes I make myself. And I'm doing weird things like, like uh, hanging uh, moose hides from the windows of the university and <laughs> stuff like that. And, and, but how did I get away with it is what's important. Because on one day, I'm riding my motorbike down the stairs. <laughs> and on the next day, I'm producing a scientific report which is spot on, see? And, and it comes back to what David and David were saying. Do it right, do it clean, do it perfect, and they cannot complain, see? And this is what we have to do. We have to do it right, do it clean, do it perfect, like irreproachable. When I want to take my students to Colorado, we made, it was this thick, and the students had made it. So every single uh, thing that they wanted to say, you can't take the students across the Rocky Mountains because of the van, because of things. And what are they going to learn? Well, I took four courses. They were going to learn philosophy of outdoor education, leadership in outdoor education, research in outdoor education. So we were testing uh, outdoor gear for the research part. We were going to, to Loretto Taft campus in Illinois. We were going to visit a nuclear factory. They were going to learn English. They were going, and we documented every single thing and did it right. And the, the document was this thick, see? So anything that they could possibly imagine putting in against us, sorry, we got an answer for you. It is perfect. And they, ca they cannot do anything about it, see. So science is very important too. And I was discussing with this with my, my, my buddy and partner, uh, Manu Trancao, Dr. Manu Trancao, who works, who has replaced me at the university. And we're discussing this a lot. No, he is bringing science 
into wilderness survival. Like, I mean, pure and hard science with, with uh, review, peer-reviewed articles in scientific magazines. So, so he's proving that the research in wilderness survival and the research in bushcraft and, and people like Linda and uh, Teresa and all the others that are, and, and, and Lisa, they're, they're doing fantastic things with academia and bringing it back on the map as a true and, and studyable subject that is, that is possible to publish in peer-reviewed things. And because it's solid, it's straight, it's, nobody can say anything about it, and, and we gain our letters of nobleness through that, in, um, and it's, and other people appreciate it anyway because it doesn't prevent us from being a rebel. See, yeah. it doesn't prevent us from being a rebel and 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 being colorful. But we have to be colorful and at the same time be serious. Mm -hmm. Can't do one without the other. I think what you're hearing is vital and important information from all of these gentlemen. Um, because many of you are instructors and work with kids and want to move forward in this and can trip over your, your own feet and your own ideals and thinking it's all just cool. Rebel, yes, but methodical and meticulous before you can be a rebel. Rebel as, rebel. as they say, you must learn and live the rules before you can start breaking them. Now, um, I want to shift this only into same sort of place, but... Uh, a friendlier subject matter, um, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll start over on my left and we'll go through. Um, clearly, we are all knowing that all four of you gentlemen, we want many, many, many more years of instruction from you, inspiration from you, guidance, and learning. That said, there are new crops. In a word, or, you know, of either a school or a person, who is there today that we also, that's out there now, that's vibrant and teaching skills that we might not know of here at this conference that we can look to? I'll start with you, David. Uh, that's, that's hard to stick with just a couple. I'd say, I'd say that, are you talking about schools or people? Schools and or people. Sure, your choice. Well, we just had the pleasure of the Boulder Outdoor Survival School allowing the old timers to come train them for a few days to tell them about what it used to be like. And it was their idea. So they brought a bunch of us old timers over there to put them through the mill and trying to figure out how to. And I was really encouraged to see how great and powerful and loving and strong and capable there's a lot of young people out there that are great. So not to name any names, all of them impressed me. And I go away saying, I think I would with confidence send anybody to that school right now because I think they're going to get a good experience. David. And we didn't used to be able to say that because we didn't know them anymore. Yeah. David Westcott? Yeah, President Accepted, I'd say probably um, in the field, probably Tim Smith, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Mountain Bushcraft. He's not here because he's out doing what we're talking about. So I, I'd say he's an up-and-comer who's doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, so far as somebody who I've been <coughs> stealing a lot of information from lately and has pumped out some really, really good stuff lately, that's Don Cavellis. Uh, the stuff he's doing on podology and, and fuel consumption and stuff like that is head and shoulders above just about every, anything else I've seen uh, in the field. And, and, I'm, and I'm stealing the stuff left and right and using it again in my classes now because it's so good that, um, yeah. Uh, I'll add my own to this, that if you're ever in Ontario, there's a little, uh, sort of a hard-to-find fellow. Uh, you can usually reach him through David Aramis School, but his name is Doug Getgood, and he is a wonderful man to learn from on all respects. So Doug Getgood in Ontario, uh, southern Ontario, out of Toronto, is, is someone who would I recommend. Uh, Morris, uh, uh, nowadays, who, who, do you, who do you think is carrying the flame well? Uh, I haven't kept up on it. Uh, maybe I'll suggest it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> well, I have 20 acres of land, and for every tree I cut down as a, in the profession of trying to teach survival, it sprung up on my property. Because I, the piece of land I acquired was open pasture, and when I stopped mowing the hay, it's, 
spruces and trees came up thick as your hair in my head. When my son was born, someone gave us some spruce trees, and he is 48 years old, and that spruce tree, one of the spruce trees is bigger than a hug. Now, I couldn't really feasibly go to the expense of making a sewage field in the common sense because of the lack of the percolation in the soil. So uh, our family would produce probably a cube of human ore that's maybe like six by six by six on an annual basis. And in a few years when it would compost, it wasn't flushed down the toilet. It was put on my fruit trees and my raspberry canes and all that. And uh, as a result, I tend to grow a very uh, dense, uh, flourishing raspberries and, and, and that sort of stuff. So uh, some of us are saying that one of the biggest disasters environmentally is the flush toilet because it's a one-way affair. We go to great expense to get rid of everything that way and that's it. And it doesn't go back to replenish the fertility of our soil. Is that going to catch up on us? <laughs> well, I didn't really mean to get into those things. <laughs> Because Mother Nature said, well, we'll try to prove to everybody else that you probably might not have done that much harm as far as other people are concerned because for every tree you cut down, another one has grown on his property. When I visit my old sites, uh, you can recognize by the density of stuff, well, like Larry Dean Olson once, uh, was, it, uh, was it him that went to an old activity area? And then we said, and he said, what do you think has happened here? Everybody thought that the, that the natural environment was, uh, was uh, the natural environment was impoverished. And he said, no, this, this, this area is where we were active and everything came up uh, opposite from what you would have thought. So Mother Nature will often, um, you know, act that way. Where humans, as I, uh, some of you have heard the, <clears throat> the sort of uh, statement that when you, try to figure out and adopt a, a situation and you come up with a rational insight and knowledge about something and you thought you solved the problem but you didn't because you have to do the direct opposite of what you've come up with and humanity doesn't appreciate that as an option. Check to make sure that the opposite is far superior to what you came up with. And I think it's happened. I, I, I said that because, like I say, uh, I, I, I didn't mean to have the, the bush come up on my property, thick as hair on your head, to replace the trees I cut. But when I did cut them, an awful lot of people were, were a asking me to act as if I shouldn't do that. And that was inconsequential. I couldn't teach people how to build a lean-to without cutting a lot of boughs. I couldn't teach people how to build a comfortable bed so that an injured person would stay comfortable till he was evacuated and stuff like that because a lot of the people were not professional enough to see that, that you, you, you should know how to utilize the forest. And when you utilize it properly, well, it's repugnant to, 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 to make it worse. It, it doesn't uh, fulfill any requirement to try to keep it pristine uh, and, and so on, but you can make it way better than normal if you know what you're doing. Therefore, it can be an improvement. And if you don't think in those sort of ways, uh, usually, uh, you know, the, <laughs> I mean, it's a subtle thing, but I've lived long enough to see the consequences, and the consequences weren't the flack that I got and had to defend myself. Fortunately, I, I was in a position to have enough authority to, to make my mark, but, uh, but usually, how would I have guessed that there would be a, a tree for every tree I cut down in, in, a, in my career that has sprung up on my property? Morris, uh, before I give it to you, Andre, as far as the future, uh, uh, one, one, one name, greatest inspiration for you. Who, who has been in a single name, perhaps one of your oh. greatest inspirations. And it's the man that made all those walking sticks, there, Tom Roycroft. Yeah. Because uh, I decided to become a writer when in high school, probably grade 11. 
And ultimately, you might think I'm joking, but Huey, Louie, and Dewey, you know who they are, concerned with Donald Duck. I, 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 don't, I don't remember whether they were nephews of his or whatever. Nephews, they used, yeah, yeah. Uh, they used to go camping, and every time they ran into a problem, they whipped out the woodchuck manual. And I thought, I'll send for it. People told me, don't be silly. That's a figment of the imagination. <laughs> Knowing Mr. Disney, I would have liked to call the wood, a book that was called The Woodchuck Manual, and I inquired, and no one had written it. So I said, I'm going to write it. <laughs> so on, on my way there. With it. So I had a focus of collecting the information that would have gone in the Woodchuck Manual that would be handy to a person who is not, doesn't have all the answers, but the book might have answers. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, Andre, uh, as far as uh, moving forward into the future, who, who do you see as, as being very instrumental in leading the charge? A name or a school or both? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give a vote to academia, okay? Um, not, not because I believe in academia more than anything else, but academia and uh, similar events. Like today I met a young man who is in this room who did his 2,000th bow drill fire today. That's 2,000. And, 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 and he has them. That's good, eh? Now, <clears throat> now, I don't have any idea how many bow drill fires I've made in my life. Probably 2,000 as well. But I didn't count them. And he has. He's counted every single one of them. He's documented every one of them, and which, which type of string he's using. This guy is in academia, okay? Even if he doesn't do it in an academia setting, I'm talking about academia in its larger sense. I'm talking about documenting things, about writing them down, about experimenting things in a scientific and, and correct way. And if you do that, whether you're doing it through a school or not, my favorite saying to my students, and I'm famous for this saying just as much as you are for your, your saying, my saying is, don't let university ruin your education. Okay. <clears throat> and I've done weird things with that. I, my students come into my class, and one year I tried this. Now, you other academia guys, you try this, okay? I told my students, fine, you're here now in front of me, 24 of you. You've all got A's in this course right now. End of discussion, now let's learn, okay? Earn it, is what I told them. Earn that A. And the students all applauded, and they all earned that A, okay? And I didn't have any grading to do, Nothing else, I just made them earn, they just earned it, okay? And it was fantastic. And then I got called up to the dean's office. <laughs> Mr. Bourbeau, what the hell are you doing? You're not allowed to do that. I said, fine. So I went back and then next year I said, class, last year I had a problem with everybody having A's. How do you feel about everybody having a B? It'll be a B plus. And we did the same thing. And I got called up to the dean's office again. You know, but I didn't care. You see what I mean? I, do it right. Do it right and do it correctly and, and it'll work. It doesn't matter whether you're kidding me or not. So to answer your question, who's up and coming? Dr. Manu Trancar for one, he's here today. He's replacing me at the university, and he's uh, directing the uh, outdoor program that uh, I originally started. He's uh, also uh, uh, getting involved very heavily in our, our outdoor research laboratory, which I founded back in the 1990s. And he's, uh, he's doing scientific research on all kinds of things, like on, on the shelter shapes, on the, and, and doing it in a scientific, methodical way, and publishing it in, in magazines. And there are others, too, that I know of that are some of my former students as well, that are now uh, at the doctoral level, and some of them are doing
doing things like with adventure therapeutic education with kids that have cancer and, and proving with a scientific method that taking kids out on trips uh, will help to, to them to recover from their cancer problems and, and, and uh, specializing in that. And then I see several academians here uh, from, from the UK and from everywhere else that are doing incredible research on, on bushcraft skills. Uh, Teresa, for example, with the, right on the specific topic of tanning hides. I mean, we wouldn't have seen this years ago. So the future is looking very promising to me because of all you youngsters that are way better than I will ever be from now on, okay? Yeah. David, you... Uh I think uh, one of the things we we neglect to pay attention to, and that is history. You know, we're I think we're at a point to where bushcraft has kind of come on fully formed, and it's exploding right now. But I'm not sure that people are sure of what their history is. And I think if I I did some content analysis just by picking out uh, um, uh, videos of, that people were teaching things, little tricks and things like that, I could probably identify 90% of what they were teaching. From the, from the masters of the golden age of camping, the 1900s up to the 1930s. Uh, more people were camping in the US than, than any time before or since per capita. And so there was just hundreds of books published on the, on, on the topic. And all of that stuff now is finding its way into bushcraft skill sets without ever having any understanding where it came from. These guys were the guys who wrote it down. They were the ones who preserved it from their frontier heritage had the direct connection back to people who used that on the land. And I think they need to be recognized. I think this idea of, of, the, of the elders of the tribe um, needs to be recultivated in, in our movement. Uh, the fact that there is a history, that there is some, somebody back there that we need to, to realize is important. You know, people have heard Kephart and Nesmuk and, and maybe Warren Miller. Um, but other than that, I don't think uh, probably uh, people could name a dozen names that, that came out of that time period. And I think you ought to know them all. I think they ought to be honored. Those are the guys that, uh, that those are the guys whose shoulders you're standing on. So history, I think, is important. History allows you to have a roadmap to the future. If you have no history, you're just kind of blowing in the breeze. So learn your learn your history. Hmm? I, th I think yeah, I think that's an incredible point, Dave. Uh, Dave. Um, and I know uh, again, Chris Noble and I were, were were speaking about that fact that that there are so the, maybe many or few. Either way, there are names that the new generation, if you will, the, or younger instructors need to know if you don't know it. Um, if you saw a TV show and thought it'd be cool to teach a fire bow, nuh -uh. There is a, a, a radically important and valuable history behind that skill. And these gentlemen beside me here are the purveyors of that history, the, 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 a, a massive part of that history. Um, gentlemen, with your permission, if you, uh, if you, do you feel uh, enough energy to take a couple of questions from the audience at this point? Yeah? So I think, I think uh, Chris, I'd like to do that. Um, I, I will remind you, uh, I'll remind you of the rules. Um, again, no commentaries, please. Uh, and if it is, is you, it's absolutely necessary, uh, concise, and then the point of your question. Uh, but uh, And no personal questions uh, that, that can be answered on another occasion. So uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to open it up. We're going to take just a few. Uh, and then we will be, and then we'll be closing uh, the panel discussion. But we're going to take some questions. They can be for everyone, um, uh, or they can be for one person. Uh, that would be fine. So uh, uh, we've got a hand up right here. Yes, sir. Yes, you gentlemen. Yes, sir. You can yell it out, and I'll repeat it. Would be fine. Okay, we got a we got a microphone. My question is. Uh Forest kindergartens in Scandinavia. Sorry, microphone to your mouth. Forest kindergartens in Scandinavian countries. I've seen a few documentaries on them. They start out at five years old. They're they're in the forest. They they're all issued knives at at a kindergarten level and instructed in the use of them. And they go out on nature walks and they climb and, and trees. Okay. And, and the question. Well, do you think that that might be a way forward into the future that here, like Morris was talking about the local Alberta school board, 
Okay. Could they be convinced on So, and this would be a question right. for all of the gentlemen, I assume, sir. So, yes. so forest kindergartens, which is the, the <laughs> concept of, of, of starting very, very young with uh, children in the forest uh, and learning skills that might be uh, otherwise potentially questionable. I'll, I'll give a quick brief uh, go on that. First of all, is, um, I taught my son how to use a knife by giving him a butter knife and mushrooms when he was four years old. And um, uh, there is a, a, a thing called the Children's Nature Network that Richard Louvre has begun down in the United States that uh, I'm just, just in love with. It, it, the, the basic concept is to get kids back out in nature. But when it comes to these skills and so on, and, and what this gentleman is uh, questioning, you, you look like you're ready to first there, Dave. That, that's how it works at my house. <laughs> well, I, I, I can imagine how it works at your house, David. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's what I've been there, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, you lost time? Yeah, well, well uh, I think it's, uh, again, a question of risk management. Um, and, and if we do proper risk management, then these things will become accepted in our schools, and we will be able to do it again. Be but we won't be able to do it without risk management now. You know, it, it's, we're going to have to prove that we did it with, with paper knives <laughs> for a long time before giving them a real knife in their hands. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. They w won't let, today's society won't let them cut themselves too often before cutting that off completely, pardon the pun. Uh, uh, Morris or, or David Westcock, do you disagree with what's uh, being said about going, going really young? Well, I have had the privilege to work in the Hutterite colonies. And no matter what age group I encountered there, they all had a pocket knife. <laughs> so whether, you know, as far as I could tell, from kindergarten that, if that was the, they felt naked like if they didn't have a pocket knife. I don't know uh, as much the girls, but the boys definitely had. Because I learned when I would peel a tree, thinking I was going to demonstrate, and when I turned my head, they were all peeling their own tree. They got the pocket knives out, and, uh, and so on. So I got the impression that the, uh, the older people in the club probably uh, either didn't care whether or participated in making sure that they knew how to handle a knife as soon as, as so soon as yeah. they and, could and handle a knife. So. You made a really good point there, Morris, is, and I should have said it too. My son and my daughter, when they were four, had the, had the butter knife and the mushrooms. Uh, Dave, I don't, I don't imagine you're going to disagree, but... No, I'm going to disagree, other than the fact that I think you need to get paper knives to university students. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It gets pretty scary when you yes. hand a knife to somebody who's never handled one before. And I think we've almost skipped a generation of people who uh, got caught in the, that time warp between the time where the um, industrial education programs were taken out of the classroom instead of, and, and computers replacing them, and, and, and teaching kids to, that computers were the future. And to where now we've got people in, in, this, in this movement that are saying, no, we've got to get back to nature and we've got to reconnect the hands and the heart and the head, make everything work in unison. But there's that gap, there's that group of kids now that are, that are becoming adults that uh, scare the heck out of me uh, because they just had no connection with the outdoors and no connection between their heads and their hearts and their hands. And so we've got, they're just kind of bumbling around. We need to grab those people because they're, they're going to be the next voters and they scare me. Well, I... I all of this said, and yes, and again, my children played in puddles with leeches. All of those things, because the, the natural fear is, uh, there is no natural fear. It's not there when they're that young. Spiders and creepy crawlers and all this. But again, I think it's important to keep Andre's caveat involved there, that if we are educators and if we are doing this, we do need to do it in this methodical, well, very well risk-managed way, or we are open to mistakes. And then as soon as there's one, we're all held accountable. So there's one of you takes a student out foolishly and irresponsibly. Everybody in this room is now apologizing for you because of the way you didn't properly teach knife handling or so on and so forth. So I think Andre's caveats will always remain vital in this discussion. We'll go with another question. You have someone there? Yep, go ahead. What is the hardest situation you guys have been in and how did you guys deal with it? What is the hardest situation we've all been in and how do we deal with Boy, pull up a cup of tea, folks. Uh, 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 you know, I, 
I, I answer this question on so many keynotes. I, I don't want to steal the stage and answer it, except that I, I would just say one thing. I always get asked the question of where's the hardest place? And here is my answer, and I know my Canadian associates will agree with me. There is no hardest place. There's only a very difficult temperature, and that's freezing. When it's cold, it's hard. When it's warm, you have forgiveness time. So for me, I don't care if I'm on the side of a mountain or the edge of a volcano, it's always about temperature. So for me, that is my hardest situation, is being in the cold, because you can't stop. You can catch your breath when it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but not when it's minus 45. Anyway, sorry, hardest, uh, uh, most difficult situation. Okay, uh, a Vietnam vet that I know, uh, a, a machine gun toting ma marijuana grower from Southern Arizona said, uh, he said, uh, the purpose of life is to polish our souls. And women and children have been the most abrasive agent I've encountered so far in life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, being in love with people and, and not necessarily feeling connected to them has been the roughest thing in my life. There you go. Yeah. I'm <clears throat> And gentlemen, I'm going to, I know that the questioner probably meant in the wilderness. But and I'm I know, gonna, I, I, I know, know that. I know, but I could keep it real short because no, no. otherwise it's a lot of long stories and I can't go there right now. <laughs> yeah. David Westcott, most difficult. Well, my stock answer to that is I was a survival instructor, so my job is not to get into difficult situations. Yeah. So I try to avoid everyone I can. Um, I know there's been some pickles, but, you know, that, that's been my profession is to, is to see people way, get people to see their way through hard times and, and to solve the problems before they become something that's, that's going to be too difficult. That's like the question that you get all the time, if you only had one knife for the outdoors, what knife would it carry? You know, I think I can count on one hand how many times I've been outdoors with only one knife on me. So, you know, you, get, you use the one you got and you make the best of it. And the same with hard situations, you just try to make as best you can. So I, I really can't. Well, other than bears coming into Wikips and pulling people out the door in the middle. Okay, of not 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 going to let you off this one. Go with that. <laughs> bear pulling you. The, uh, bear in the Wiki up. Go. Oh, we just well we just done a, a sheep kill up on up on Boulder Mountain, and it was in the middle of probably the, one of the driest summers we'd ever have had, and uh, we had three we have three permanent Wikiups built at 8,500 feet, and these things are big enough for about 10 or 12 people apiece, in these Wikiups, and uh, they've been standing in place for probably. What, 30 years, 30, yeah. 35 years. I know they rebuilt one of them this year. <clears throat> and we had just done a sheep kill, and it was this drought, so things were hun hungry and, and things were dry. And we uh, had uh, sheep in, uh, in a steam pit cooking, and then we had the hide on a rack. And in the middle of the night, everybody was in these wiki ups, and uh, uh, one of the girls, everybody woke up with a girl screaming. And it was a bear had come in the door and walked, reached across two guys and grabbed a girl on the far side of the wicket by the ankle. And she saw the bear coming in and was halfway out the door and screamed and the bear let her go. And so everybody was beating on the bear's head with logs trying to get it to go back out. So it stayed there all night long, just out of the firelight. We built a great big fire and it would stay in the shadows, just going back and forth all night long until finally we just, wow. we, we left. I, I will, I, I will. I, 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 w I will add one, one little piece of color to this, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Andre first, and then Morse. Um, uh, two pieces, actually. One is, one is that when I have gotten in trouble, it's always only ever been one reason. I got cocky. That's the only reason I've ever gotten in trouble. I got cocky. Literally saying to myself, I'm Survivor Man. What could go wrong? And that's when I got into a lot of trouble. Um, it was that, that, th that foolish uh, cockiness that got me there. Um, and a quick story about uh, Andre. I don't know what story he's going to relate, but I can tell you that when I was admiring him and watching his films before I'd met him, and then I met him, and, and, and the one thing he said after he did one particular survival experience, uh, which was a long-term one, the second he was in the rescue plane, I think it might have been, the first thing uh, word out of his mouth to the pilot was, give me your matches. That was it. Give me your matches. Right there. All he cared about was getting that pack of matches more than anything else. But I didn't want to steal your thunder, but I never forgot that ever in, in my life that that was part of your story. So toughest situation. Well, I, I was on a lot of voluntary things, but uh, toughest one is the same as you. I got cocky. Um, springtime. Uh, on the Sagney River with a new girlfriend in a canoe, 
This is how you do a... <laughs> draw. <laughs> and I'm in freezing water with ice at 6 o'clock at night, and it gets dark at 6.30, and I'm floating down, and there's no way I can shake out that canoe or do anything. And I'm in a little wetsuit with just like this and uh, it got dark and all I could see were the lights eight kilometers away and uh, I thought the wind was going in the right direction to pull me back to shore but I wasn't sure and I thought and I was pulling rope out of my pockets to tie my wrists up to hers on the other side of the canoe and this was a real situation I mean we had no I was ha not having any fun at all I was thinking I was going to die, and uh, and 45 minutes later, when I was like this, uh, my feet touched the ground, and uh, I instantly dove down in superhuman strength. Just whoo, that canoe was up, and we were both in there. I just pulled, you're going in there, and I'm going in there, and I paddled with my paws, because I didn't have any hands left, paddled with my paws with the, the, the paddle like this, and, you know, and getting to shore, and my house was just there, and I get to my house, and I, I jump in the shower, because I'm hypothermic, and with my wrists, I <laughs> turn on the shower, <laughs> and then what, what happened before that is while she was in the canoe, she started yelling and screaming, like like about two minutes after she was in the canoe, she was yelling and screaming, and I mean, yelling and screaming, and, ah, like this, you know? And I said, calm down, calm down, it's gonna be okay. But one or two minutes later, I was down in the bottom of the canoe going, ah, because you know when you get your feet frozen? Like our whole body was like that. And ev the whole body was unshaking, and like, oh, oh, you know, and, and unfreezing. It was grand old time we got into that shower like this. You know. Morris, uh, in, 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 in your... All that because... You got cocky. Yeah. Yeah. Showing off. Showing off. That's what it... It'll do it every time. Uh, uh, Morris, uh, in, in, your, in your pursuits, uh, most, most difficult situation, <laughs> dangerous situation. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think because there is so, which one am I going to talk about? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because there's so many opportunities, simple and otherwise, don't jump in a snow bank with a moving vehicle expecting that the snow will cushion you, because it doesn't. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the situation that actually came close to taking my life was... Uh, I was working in construction as a surveyor, and this is like, you know, there's probably a hundred uh, people working with the earth moving machines, caterpillar tractors, and so on. And we moved to a new road, and uh, L for doing all that, but I thought, well, they can only give me L. I'm gonna. Anyway. The situation was we went to get water using a bucket brigade from the ne a close stream a few miles down the road. And uh, I saw all kinds of posters around that said, don't ride in the bucket of an earth mover. And I learned that maybe you sort of like say, well, what's the alternative? My alternative was to choose to sit on top of that two-wheeled water wagon holding on to the D-rings <laughs> to stay up, and not sort of saying, well, if you, you, know, if you really lurch severely, uh, you can't depend on the, those lids to keep you on top of that. So I'm riding. Well, we go, we have no trouble going to the, the, the creek, and we fill it, the bucket brigade, everybody except me goes back to the, the bucket of the earth mover. And when the, uh, the earth mover was decelerating to turn off the road, it unhitched. 
It's a two-wheel trailer. It's full of, it's like 200 gallons of water. The hitch digs into the ground. And as I lurch forward, and I figured that because I was a gymnast at one time, that it saved my life. My hat was flying off, and when I hit the ground way ahead of the trailer, I was really badly, uh, what do you call that, rash, when you get falling off of motorcycles. <laughs> I, I had an awful lot of rash, an awful lot of this arm, and I tumbled. And as I pulled the lid off, it followed me and hit me next to my spine. And uh, of course, I hit the ground and I was knocked unconscious, as far as I understood. And the water came out of the water wagon on top of me, so I was laying in a large amount of water and mud. And when I hit the ground, I lost all recollection. I got the sensation after that that I had a noon meal and we had an opportunity to go and lay down and sleep. That's the sensation I had during that event. And then uh, uh, I actually wake up probably an hour later, and I'm wedged between two mattresses covered with mud, and the hospital was 50 miles away, and there's a fellow in the back of the truck sort of, you know, peering down, trying to take care of me. And uh, I, 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 <laughs> I had difficulty breathing because I was wedged between two regular, you know, bed mattresses. Well, the debriefing, when I got back after a long time, I sort of, you know, tried to structure what happened. And uh, when I flew off and I hit the ground, I was laying there in this pool of water, and everybody, you know, was very concerned. They came around me, and they were scared to touch me because I really flew a long distance through the air, and my back might be broken, so they were afraid to move me. And uh, I essentially had to be the medic, medic because when I, you know, I had no recollection of this. This is the audience is telling me. They said, that, well, I'm cold. You should, well, what if your back is broken? And I said, my back isn't broken if I can lift both legs off the ground. So I proved it. I said, my back, well, <laughs> except that I must know something about that. Well, what should we do about you? I get two mattresses, roll me on one and put another mattress on top and take me to the hospital. I'm telling them everything they need to know to be able to do it. And without me directing them, they were like, you know, that was, a, that was an era where there wasn't, a, not that I remember a single first aid kit in that camp or a first aid person and so on. So fortunately, I, I, I was able to direct them and tell, tell them what to do. And uh, when I got to hospital, and I, I can say, I, I was very lucky. I really, I probably, uh, it, it didn't hit me in the spine, but near there, it was ex so excruciatingly painful if I moved. And the doctors uh, I, were concerned that they had to keep me uh, for, for quite a while. Besides that, there was like a, probably, you know, just a token doctor instead of there being a hospital full of doctors. And that was the worst thing I think I ever did. Mm. Uh, Maybe that's why I walk the way I do. Andre Francois Bobo, Morse Kochansky, David Westcott, David Halliday. If you will, uh, we'll bring back to the stage uh, uh, Chris and David, and we'll continue on. Uh, Titans, please remain seated, and then, uh, and then we'll be done momentarily. Th thank you, Les, and, and you, were at, you actually did what I was going to do. Thank these guys. I mean, the, the volume of what they've taught others and what we were kind of talking about when we kicked this thing off, really what they've done in terms of research, and as Andre put a, put a, a nice little stamp on it, Academia, these guys have been the academia. The, and Moore's in particular, the volume of research, but taking a step further, we haven't recognized many of the inventions that he has put together as well. And that, that is pretty amazing. Les, you have been absolutely fantastic. When we first reached out to you, you've had a lot of influence on what's happened here. Um, you've been 
fantastic, and we can't thank you enough for your participation at the highest level. And for that, we would like to pass one of these backpacks along to you. Thank you. <laughs> and as a thought leader we, and moderator tonight, we would appreciate you Absolutely. passing these out to the, the rest of our uh, keynote speakers Ladies tonight. and gentlemen, again, once at a time, though, Mr. Andre Francois Bobo. <laughs> Sticking with the younger crowd, Mr. David Halliday. <laughs> hey, brother. An inspiration to us all, Mr. David Westcott. <laughs> and the legend in person, Morse Kochansky. And if you guys would indulge us for just a minute, uh, would it be possible if we could get you guys together towards the front of the stage and give uh, an opportunity for folks to take pictures? And I know we would like, uh, as the, the Global Bushcraft Society, to capture some pictures as well. But no, um, Moores, you, can we get, up, get you up and get some pictures too, please? Fantastic. One more time, people.